Hello and welcome to One to Grow On, a show where we dig into questions about agriculture and try to understand how food production impacts us and our world. My name is Hallie Casey and I studied and currently work in agriculture. And I'm Chris Casey, Hallie's dad. Each episode, we pick an area of agriculture or food production that confuses a lot of people and try to get Hallie to explain it. And this week, we are focusing on superfoods again. All right. I am feeling good about this. I really enjoyed our last superfood episode. Yeah, it was good. I liked it, too. And now I eat chia seeds. Oh, really? Yeah. I haven't uh, made that parfait thing in a while that uh, you taught me how to make because I forgot how to make uh-huh. it. but. <laughs> um usually what i'll do is i'll i'll get some frozen fruit and put it in a bowl and pour some flax milk over it and i'll put some chia seeds uh-huh. in that and you know let it sit overnight in the fridge and in the morning i have a delicious breakfast it's really good it's really good it is good stuff and today the first thing that we're talking about is something else that you can also put in that little overnight thingy if you want to oh yeah it's flax flax huh flax what do you know about flax um I know it makes some kind of funky brown crackers and bread that's not usually as good as normal bread. I I guess that's true. Regular wheat bread. I don't know. Have I actually? Yeah. I don't know. It's flax. It's a it's a (laughs) seed, right? And it is a seed. Yes. So that's all I know. Cool. Yes, it's a seed. Uh, what you can make linen from it. That's where we get linen is from flax. Oh, maybe I did know that too. Yeah, they started making linen out of flax like 30,000 years ago in Georgia. Whoa. Very old plant. Yeah. Like Atlanta? Uh, Nope. Not Georgia, Atlanta. Nope. Georgia in the Fertile Crescent, which is where originally flax is from. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. Actually, Charlemagne was very into flax. He like passed a lot of laws to make people eat more flax and he was just all about it. He loved he loved flax very much. So he was into overregulation. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Look, I have a soft spot in my heart for, you know, rulers who loved an agricultural product, had a certain affinity for a certain plant. I just think that's very cute. I think it's cute. Well, uh, let it be known that Hallie Casey thinks Charlemagne is cute. <laughs> I guess at least his love of flax. I think his love of flax is very cute. That I will say. Nothing else about Charlemagne will I say. All right. So where does this stuff come from anyway? The Fertile Crescent, yeah. Oh, doesn't everything come from the Fertile Crescent? <laughs> I don't know. A lot of stuff does, you know, because it's so fertile. So people eat this a lot of different ways. Uh, mostly they'll put it in things like smoothies or oatmeal, like you mentioned before. We have flax flour, which goes into things like muffins and bread. You can also put it, like, on your salad as, like, a little seed, the way you can put, like, sesame or pumpkin seeds or something in a salad. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Also, apparently, it's used to symbolize Northern Ireland as well, which is nice. I had no idea. Neither did I. So, it goes into, like you said, all these foods. Mm-hmm. I guess it's not bad for you. Um, and it's always something that I hear, you know, is a health food. Is it really a healthy food? Um, if you, I mean, depending on what you compare it to, yes. I mean, it's fairly health. It's very, it's fairly healthful. Yeah. Um, it's very high in alpha linoleic acids, which are those omega-3 fatty acids that are in chia as well. Okay. And those have, you know, been shown to reduce likelihood of stroke and heart disease and other cardiac events. Same thing you can get from uh, fish. Yep. Fish and chia. And, you know, there's some other sources as well. You can buy it in tablet form. It also is quite high in lignin. Do you know what lignin is? I've never even heard of lignin. What's a lignin? Well, I know you have heard of it because I've definitely talked to you about lignin in the past, but that's fine. Uh, Okay, I've heard of lignin. I just don't remember hearing of lignin. (laughs) So lignin is what makes plants strong. So things like branches and tree trunks are mostly lignin. They're this like really, really sturdy thing, compound, structure in a plant. Uh, and we don't eat a lot of lignin. It's very hard for our human bodies to break that down. We don't usually eat a lot of very strong and hearty plant material because our stomachs are just not really as strong as something like a goat, which can eat kind of whatever because they're very strong on the inside and on the outside, too. Goats are strong. Okay, so two questions about that. 
Uh-huh. One, I thought the sturdy stuff in plants was cellulose. Mm-hmm. Okay. And are those different? And two, if it has a lot more lignin in it than other plants, and it's not one of those things that we digest really, then how do we eat it? Okay. So the first question, um, cellulose is something that makes parts of plants strong, but cellulose makes like green parts of plants strong. So cellulose is what makes up things like plant cell walls in leaves and in like petioles, which are like the little stems that hold on to leaves. Things that are green, mostly, right, um, are, is what cellulose is. So lignin is things like bark and wood and stuff like that. Oh, see, I thought bark and wood was just really hard cellulose. It is lignin. There is also, you know, often cellulose in there as well. But the thing that makes, like, a branch stronger than, like, the stem of a flower is that lignin. All right. As for your second question, I don't know, honestly. I mean, it's very small, right? So it's easier to, for us to break down small things as opposed to us, like, chomping on, like, the bark of a tree. Right. Would be much harder than us just eating a seed that has, like, lignin in it, but it's, like, a very small little seed. So I imagine that has something to do with it. But I am not particularly familiar with the human GI abilities. So I cannot answer that question fully, but that is my hypothesis. Fair enough. As someone Fair who knows enough. some things, yeah. I mean, it's seed size. It's not, like you said, bark size or whatever. Yeah. All right, go on. So as you can imagine, there's not a ton of science about lignin because we don't eat a lot of lignin generally. But there is some science that shows that lignin might reduce tumor genesis in human beings. That's a big claim. It is a very big claim. Uh, and um, there has been some science in humans that consumption of lignin might correlate to a reduction of breast cancer and a decrease in prostate cancer markers. So there seems like there, you know, quite possibly is some connection to a decrease in more general cancer risk if you consume more lignin, which flax is high in. Now, this is not conclusively proven. There is still a lot of studies being done, but there seems to be some promising results, more, more broadly speaking, about lignin. Well, yeah, but that's, I mean, it's, like you said, more research needing, needed, but it's at least kind of exciting. It's very exciting. There have also been human studies that have shown that flax seeds can lead to a reduction in bad cholesterol and can also lead to a reduction in blood pressure. For these studies, it's, it's not super clear what the mechanism is, whether it's good for you to just more generally eat seeds, which have things like good fatty acids and nice protein. It's not clear if this if this specific lignin is the thing that's causing it, which is kind of what sets flax apart from some of the other seeds that we eat that are also healthy for us. Uh, but, I mean, seeds are good for you. There is some evidence that lignin, which is what, you know, we really see in flax, you don't see in a lot of other places. There's, there's still science being done about that. However, flax does have those omega-3 fatty acids, and it is pretty clear that those are good for you. Nice. So part of it might just be eating a more healthful diet, but like I said, it's got the omega-3s and we're still learning about lignin. Yeah, there is some very promising possibilities with lignin and its relation to human cancer risk. So that's what we know about health benefits for flax. Lots of interesting possibilities. Yes. Often people eat it kind of comparably to things like chia and oats. We were trying to kind of when I, when I think about superfoods and, like, how healthy they are for you and how super they are, I kind of like to compare it to other things that we think are maybe not so super, like oats. So when we look at something like oats, which might also go into your oatmeal in, in addition to flax. I mean, if you have oatmeal, doesn't it by definition have oats? Yeah, but, I mean, you can have an oatmeal that's, like, all oats or an oatmeal that has things like chia and flax and berries and almonds. And you can add a bunch of things to it. So... This is oftentimes where people will eat flax is in an oatmeal. So when we compare it to oats, it's fairly comparable in terms of protein, which is great. It doesn't have those omega-3 fatty acids. Chia itself, chia has more fiber, but actually has fewer omega-3 fatty acids per gram. And it doesn't have this lignin, which may or may not have cancer benefits or anti-cancer benefits, I guess. All right. So when we get right down to it, is it cape worthy? Mm -hmm. I think it has the potential to be cape-worthy, depending on 
these this ability for lignin. Like if lignin is actually shown to reduce tumor genesis in human beings, that is 100% gape worthy. And there is some strong science, but it is not conclusively proven. So I think I will say cape pending. Cape pending. All right. I like it. All right. Are you ready for your next superfood? Ready for the next one. It is charcoal. What the heck? What do you mean? I just spent six hours smoking a brisket on the grill outside. And there's Uh little bits of charcoal in the fire pit. And yes. you're not going to tell me that I'm going to eat that and get a whole bunch of benefits. That's just no. So are you telling me, are you, are you not familiar with the claims of, of charcoal? No, I'm not. Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not familiar with the claims of charcoal. It's black stuff. You can use it to make marks on the ground. But holy cow, does it get your hands dirty? Why? 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 So. Why is a very good question. So right now, charcoal is increasingly becoming kind of a fad food. Um, And when we talk about charcoal, often it's just advertised as charcoal. But what we're actually talking about is activated charcoal, which is different from the kind of charcoal that we cook with. Activated means that it was processed at really, really high temperatures. So it's, it's fundamentally different than the charcoal that we cook with. The charcoal that we cook with isn't activated, and they also have other chemicals in and around those little charcoal, what are those called? Like pe- pellets? No- nubbles? Briquettes. 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 Yep. <laughs> okay, so we don't eat briquettes. Um, that's good to not. know. That's good to know. I mean, there's probably someone out there. I've seen a lot of weird reality television that's shows. True. There's probably someone out there who eats some actual briquettes. I would not ever recommend doing that because it is poisonous. I was going to so, say, after the cinnamon challenge, almost nothing surprises me anymore. That was that was the bar? That's the thing that, that made you not surprised at anything before? Well, no, but it went a long way. <laughs> I got that. <laughs> so people may have been taking charcoal for a very long time. We have documentation back to the early 1800s that it was being taken for health benefits, but it could have been happening for a lot longer than that and with just without documentation okay um why why do they take it so what what makes you look at a piece of charcoal and says hmm that'll help (laughs) i don't know i don't know this is i think this kind of goes back to the question of like who's who was the first person to milk a cow I think that was a good idea. Uh, who makes that call? Who, who wants to stop and say, I could eat that. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. It's, I mean, our activated charcoal is literally thousands of years old. We used to, and still do today, but it's been used for thousands of years to purify water. So that might have something to do with it. That you know, I had heard about. charcoal filters. Yeah, yeah. That's quite common. That was happening back like in the roman times people were using charcoal to purify water there was a fad in like the 80s that it might help with hangovers and there were some studies that said it did but then there were some studies that said it didn't so it kind of looks like it doesn't in terms of like the actual health benefits of activated charcoal it it is useful like medical professionals use activated charcoal okay and what do they use it for Charcoal itself is really, really large carbon molecules, right? They're like these huge, massive molecules. So if you consume activated charcoal, then this huge, large molecule surface area allows drugs to bond with it. And other, you know, bad stuff will bond with these huge carbon molecules. And so it's used to treat things like overdoses and poisonings. Interesting. I bet that probably wouldn't work for everything, but I don't know. I guess it would be kind of like a, a bezoar or bezoar or however you pronounce it, <laughs> which, you know, will help with a lot of poisons, but not all of them. But in a pinch, it might be a, your first go-to. I think that's a very good analogy for our folks at home who might not know about this. That is a thing from Harry Potter. And it is used in the sixth book and mentioned in the first book. Yes, it is. It's basically just if, if you're in acute distress, activated charcoal and bezoars are something that you can use. If I mean, if you're in the magical Harry Potter universe and activated charcoal in the real world, 
to alleviate that distress to take. And it's not going to work, like you mentioned, with everything. But if you're in really, really acute distress, it is a good option. So that's kind of the medical use for it. There are some claims that it will whiten your teeth. There is no evidence for that. Um, People eat it a lot in a lot of different things. You can get like tablets for it, which if, if you're getting it to treat things like poisonings, I would not recommend getting tablets of activated charcoal because they're much less efficacious than the actual pharmaceutical grade. Activated charcoal, it's like a different product. You cannot get the pharmaceutical grade. And so if you get it in tablet form in order to treat poisonings, it's not going to do a very good job. There are other things that you can get. So that's not a good option. Um, People will put it in ice cream. People will take it in like shot form, put it in their smoothies. There is no evidence that any of these consumptive forms have any health benefits. Kind of the only thing that currently it is proven to help with is acute poisoning. Ice cream? Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. (laughs) People do a lot of weird stuff. I do. I would say that charcoal, activated charcoal is not cape worthy. It is very beneficial for people in acute distress due to poisoning or overdose, but there is no evidence it has any other benefits, particularly as a food. And like you said, even that is uh, pharmaceutical grade. So that's not something you can just go in uh, to Whole Foods and buy. Yeah, no. I do not recommend buying any form of activated charcoal. There is no evidence that it is beneficial in any way. I wonder if the tablets are made by Kingsford. What is that? Kingsford, they're the people that made the charcoal briquettes that I used to smoke the biscuit. I imagine that. I imagine it's a slightly different production system on the back end. Well, now it's time to get into the break. Let's go. Well, hello, listener. Welcome to the mid-roll. Welcome to the mid-roll. I hope you are enjoying this episode. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoy chia and flax. I hope you enjoy this episode so much that you want to share it with a friend. Listener, do you have a friend? Do you have multiple friends? Would your friends like you better if you shared podcast episodes with them? I bet they would. (laughs) Honestly, sharing this podcast, sharing any podcast, word of mouth, heart to hearts is the very, very best way for us to grow for this podcast to expand, and for us to have more people in our little plant family. It is. And I may only have one friend, but I bet you have more than one friend. And You definitely have more than one friend, Dad. Listener, if you share it with the number of friends that I have, then this podcast will grow like crazy. Okay, that's a little braggy. No, I'm saying if they only share it with one person, even. It will grow like crazy? Well, it'll grow. It'll grow. It'll help. (laughs) It'll be a good thing in our lives. Okay, I know, first of all, I know you have more than one friend. Second of all, regardless of how many people you can share it with, we would love it if you could take this episode or another episode and share it with a friend. It would mean a lot to us. Thank you very much. And thank you to Lindsay, our Starfruit patron. We love you as always. And thank you so much to Josh, who has rejoined our closest of close plant families. Welcome back, Josh. Expect a postcard soon. (laughs) All right, should we get back to the episode? Back to the episode. Okay, so, number three, are you ready for cacao? Oh, no, cacao is definitely a superfood. I mean, (laughs) freaking chocolate, man. Am I right? Freaking chocolate, absolutely. Correct. Hot chocolate is pretty much the most magical drink ever invented. Put a cape on it. Let's go home. We're done. (laughs) Do you have you ever listened to the Amelia Project? I have not. Oh, it's a podcast. You should check it out. They high they like prominently feature hot chocolate. I would very much recommend this very good podcast about hot chocolate, amongst other things. I'm in. It's very good. Go check out Amelia Project after this episode. So let's talk about cacao so that you can do that faster. All right. Okay. Cacao probably first used by the Maya people in Central America. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know because of genocide. And also, it might have been used by someone before that, but there was not a lot of written records. So uh, that's kind of the genocide's the, not the, a good the, thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, genocide's very bad. Yeah. Um. So yeah, there's a lot. There's a very violent history 
in Central America, particularly around the agricultural products that were extracted from there by the Spanish imperialists. And cacao was one of the biggest ones. The cacao was, you can kind of argue, maybe one of the first superfoods that we have documentation of because it was this huge fad in Western Europe when it was brought back by Spanish imperialists. People thought that it was just the best drink ever. It was very expensive. Um, they they drank it as a warm drink, but it wasn't really the hot chocolate that we know today. But it was, you know, seen as a high status symbol. There were health claims around it. It was very, very popular. So people have liked to use it for a while. Yeah, it was very, very popular in Europe. You know, there is kind of a not a huge history of it in the North Americas, but that's it's from Central America and South America. Yeah, we, we don't have a lot of information on the native peoples that cultivated it and how they used it just because there is a knowledge loss and there was a lot of violence and genocide. So we don't have a lot of those histories, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a very old crop and there's been a lot of benefits seen associated with it for a long time. There's also, sorry, this is kind of a bummer of a superfood topic, but I think it's really important to talk about this superfood because it's touted a lot, very popular. Uh, another thing that is true about cacao is present day there is a lot of slavery, especially around child labor. There's a lot of forced child labor. There is also a lot of quote unquote free child labor, meaning like labor that's unforced. However, that's kind of a hard thing to say because you can't really say that a 12 year old is choosing to work for really low wages if like the op the other option of like them doing grueling work for very little pay is like them or their family starving. So the system itself is broken and I don't think that anyone wants to condone child labor in any situation. It's also, we don't really know how much this is actually happening because, you know, child traffickers and employers of child labor don't really report their numbers. So there's some research that this number is increasing in the cacao industry, but it's kind of hard to tell. If you buy fair trade chocolate, which you can do, there is a lower likelihood that your chocolate will have been cultivated by child labor. It is not a 100% foolproof system. Because agriculture, as we've mentioned in many episodes before, is a very hard to regulate industry, but there is significantly lower risk that the chocolate you are buying was produced with child labor. Okay, now all of that is said, let's talk about the health benefits. Please let it be healthy. Please let it be healthy. <laughs> so there has been some studies that have shown that it can slightly lower blood pressure. There has also been some research indicating that it can lower cardiovascular disease. There have been multiple human studies that indicate that the polyphenols that are found in cacao can actually increase your blood flow to your brain and improve your mental capacities. That, that's yet another big claim. It is, yeah. But there have been multiple human studies and it seems like there is increasingly more research to back up that claim, which is cool. There have been in vivo studies that indicate that it may reduce the risk or spread of multiple types of cancer. Now, I really want to cage that because I don't want to come out here saying like, oh, eat chocolate because it will reduce your likelihood or reduce the spread of cancers. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that there have been some studies that indicate that it may. So there's still a lot of science to do in that claim. There's also a fairly good amount of science to show that it's generally good for your skin, which is cool. However, with all of these health claims that I've rattled off, the caveat is that we're talking about cacao, which is different from chocolate. So cacao, I don't know if you've ever eaten straight cacao. I had a class in grad school where the professor studied cacao, and so he would bring in like bars that were like 87 or like 90% cacao. And it tastes very different than chocolate. It is not sweet. It is very bitter. Chocolate itself is very processed. It has a lot of dairy and sugars and fats and things that are not good for you and will kind of cancel out these actual benefits from cacao. See, nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> I know, yeah. There's no evidence that chocolate itself is good for you. There's some evidence that cacao itself is good for your skin and may have other benefits more generally. But it's very bitter, and people don't really eat it that much. 
I mean, is it is it the same as Baker's chocolate? Because I remember eating Baker's chocolate as a kid, thinking I was going to biting into a chocolate bar and being very surprised. Oh yeah, <laughs> Baker's chocolate is not straight cacao, but it has much much less sugar than your traditional chocolate. So so, so straight yeah. cacao would be even more bitter than Baker's chocolate. Yeah yeah, straight cacao wow. is very bitter. Yeah. Okay, good to know. There's also this was very interesting to me. There are people in Germany, there's like a whole group of people in Germany who do cacao as like a party drug. So again, after the cinnamon challenge, I'm like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently they have like morning raves and it's seen as like a way to be healthy and still like party and do drugs. What? You're not, you're, yeah, you're not really going to get much of a high off of snorting cacao, which is how they consume it. But I just think that's, Very interesting. Wow. Okay. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah. (laughs) When comparing it to other foods, cacao has more antioxidants than something like a blueberry, and antioxidants have a lot of proven health benefits. However, it's a lot easier to eat a lot of blueberries than it is to eat a lot of cacao. So you're never really going to eat like a quarter cup of cacao and then like. That that's how you would get more antioxidants versus eating like a quarter cup of blueberries. It's much easier to eat a lot of blueberries than it is to eat a lot of cacao because it's very bitter, and this is yeah not as delicious as a blueberry. So I feel like I know where we're landing on this, but probably not cape worthy. Probably not cape worthy. All right, it's a sad sad day. That's okay. So still delicious. When we came out of the break, I forgot to do my nature fact. Oh my god. A nature fact. We haven't had a nature fact in a couple of episodes. I know. So. Okay. Hit me. What is the one food that you know is a superfood by its name? Capers. Oh, my God. Capers. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Now you got to do the jingle. Oh, my God. (laughs) Da-da-da-da-da-da. Nature (laughs) fact. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> Come on, you know you love it. Uh I love capers. Capers I are do love capers. delicious in certain situations. Do you know capers are actually flower buds? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, they are little pickled flower buds. Oh cool. The caper plant, I guess. Well, are we talking about those next or something else? We are talking about moringa next. What? The freak is moringa. I've never heard of that. So I put moringa on the list because I so we talk about moringa a lot in development. Because it's this very exciting new crop, and it grows very well in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's, like, all the rage. Because there's a lot of benefits to growing Moringa. It's, like, it's drought tolerant. It grows very quickly. It'll grow, like, nine feet in one growing season, which is awesome. And it's seen as, like, this superfood. So you can get a higher dollar for it. So it's really great in terms of smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa that are looking at horticultural crops. Moringa is a dope option, so we talk about it a lot. It's, like, very jazzy. Okay, so what is it? Why do people want it? So it's a tree, and you can eat pretty much the whole part of it. So you can eat the roots, you can eat the bark, you can eat the leaves and the stems. You can eat the whole tree. Wow, that sounds like a magic tree. Yeah, it's very popular as a tea. Okay. Uh, you can also eat, like, the the seeds, the leaves you can eat. I don't think that a lot of people eat the leaves as like a salad, but they do dry them and have them as a tea. You can have the roots, which are starchy. You can also, I think, make fiber from it, but I don't know a ton about that. But it's just like, woo! Everyone's super excited about moringa. There's talk about like using it as a biofuel. There's, woo! There's like tons. There's, it's very jazzy right now. There's tons of talk about moringa. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. Yes. In terms of health benefits for human consumers, it's high in vitamin C. It's high in some of the other vitamins as well. It's pretty low in protein in terms of our actual ability to digest it, we think. Again, it's kind of a new jazzy food, so there's not a ton of science on it. But there's some science that's showing that while there is protein in Moringa, we can't really digest it. And it just comes out the other end. All right. It's also been shown to be high in antioxidants. But again, there's not a lot of science on it. So Dr. Manjambu Mbeke, who works at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, said the enthusiasm for the health benefits of Moringa oleifera, which is the scientific name for Moringa, is in dire contrast with the scarcity of strong experimental and clinical evidence supporting them. 
So I feel like there's not really a lot of evidence. Okay, I feel like that's just about every food fad, though, isn't it? Someone. I mean, here's about first something. Our food episode, we talked about things like quinoa and chia, which there is a lot of evidence showing that humans can like digest the proteins in quinoa, so it's a high source and good protein. Well, that's that's a fair point. Yep. There's a lot of you know foods that we've studied pretty closely because they're commonly consumed by humans, but. Moringa is just kind of new on the scene, so it's very flashy, it's very exciting. There is not a lot of actual evidence, so we don't really know. In terms of downsides, the biggest downside that we see in Moringa is that it can be invasive in certain places, which makes sense. Originally, it's from Southern Asia, South Asia area, and often when you have things that are from a tropical environment that can grow very, very quickly, like I said, Moringa can grow nine feet in one growing season. It's very easy for them to reproduce and grow quickly and invade places. Places like Florida and Australia and the Pacific Islands are discouraging production of it there because it has shown to be invasive, particularly in areas that are quite wet. So we haven't seen as much of an issue with this in sub-Saharan Africa, especially around things like drought conditions. Moringa is drought tolerant, so it can grow in drought areas, but it's just not going to proliferate the same way. Is that the only downside, though? That It's potentially an invasive species? I mean, we don't know. We don't know yet. Okay. We don't really know. It has some other benefits, like it does fix nitrogen back into the soil, which is good. But also, it's a tree. So if you have more nitrogen in your soil, you're not really going to pull the trees out to plant vegetables. So from a production standpoint, there's not an immediate benefit associated with that necessarily, unless you're what's called intercropping, where you do like maybe a line of trees and then a line of corn or cassava or something else but that's not as easy to do in orcharding systems for a lot of reasons so do we know how it compares to other food um yeah so the leaves are higher in iron and magnesium and protein than spinach but like we said before we don't know if that protein is like we're getting all of that protein whereas in spinach we are getting all the protein um the leaves are also really high in potassium the seed pods are higher in vitamin c than oranges which is like a lot of vitamin C. Wow. That's a lot of vitamin C. I mean, one orange is just about all of the vitamin C you need for a day, I think. I could be wrong, but I always thought of oranges as the gold standard for vitamin C. I mean, yeah, that's a lot of marketing. There's a lot of vitamin C in a lot of plants, but for a seed, that's really, really high in vitamin C, especially for a legume. That's like it, moringas make basically beans, like kind of like peanuts. They're like kind of a harder bean kind of thing that you eat. Um, It's like a lot of vitamins for something like that. So if all of these vitamins that are in the leaves and in the seeds and potentially in the roots or bark, they're all human available. If we can all eat them and then digest them and process them, then this could be a very good food for us. It could be extremely nutritious. But again, we're still figuring out how humans actually eat them and then process that food, like whether or not all of these nutrients are actually processed by our bodies or if they're just coming out the other end. All right. So to review, we started with flax, which mm-hmm. was, I think, cape pending. Correct. It was correct. And then charcoal, which has its place in an emergency, but otherwise, so far as we know, is not cape worthy. No capes. Cacao, sadly, no capes. No capes. Moringa, sounds like maybe cape pending. I mean, maybe. I think still, like, having leaves with nutrients is not unique to Moringa. Okay. I think you'd, you would have to have it be very nutritious in order to be a super food. The thing that I think it really does have potential to be is being a super crop. Because it can really, I mean, you can get really top dollar for Moringa. And it's something that grows a lot better in sub-Saharan Africa than it does in other places, which is very uncommon. You don't have a lot of stuff. That one, people want to eat, and two, grows better in sub-Saharan Africa than it will in the U.S. or in South Asia or in Central America for a lot of reasons. Like, it's very dry, it's very hot, and Moringa can stand those factors. So what Moringa has the potential to do is benefit farmers. I don't know if it's going to be particularly a super food. I don't, it doesn't, I mean, it seems like it can be nutritious, but... My standard for superfood is kind of higher than just having a very nutritious food. 
Like you have to ha- bring something a little bit more unique to the table for me. So I I don't think that Moringa is going to get superfood status from me, but it does have the potential to be great for farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. And it sounds like it's, you know, might be a good healthy staple. Yeah. All right. I mean, spinach is good. Yep. Moringa might also be good for you. Like, there you go. Yeah, it's always good to eat. <laughs> Fresh, healthy foods. That's not bad. I just don't know. It's not like, you know, bringing in the omega-3 fatty acids, which are like, whoa, that's next level. Or bringing in a lot of protein like quinoa did last episode. Well, if you don't have anything else, uh, I'm going to go make some chia pudding and put some flax seeds in it. Oh, yeah. Why not? Leveling up on the old diet. (laughs) Sounds excellent to me. Thanks for listening to this episode of One to Grow On. If you'd like to support the show, please write and review us on iTunes and consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash one to grow on pod. If you'd like to connect with us, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at one to grow on pod. The show is hosted by me, Hallie Casey, and Chris Casey. It's produced by Catherine RJ and Hallie Casey. Our music is something elated by Broke for Free. Be sure to check out the next episode in two weeks. But until then, keep on growing. Bye, everybody.